about the, the rollout of Bacchus Seller Systems. And if you have any questions throughout this presentation, go ahead and type them in on the, I think it's the right hand side of your screen. And I will do my best to uh, get them answered. As I'm reading these, I if you if you still can't hear me, let me know uh, by typing in that question box. But it looks like I'm getting some yeses and some noes, so I just want to make sure. Good, good. All right, I am going to move on then. I want to start off by talking a little bit about the wine market. If we look at the the people who visit a winery throughout the year, half of those people are making over $70,000 a year. 37% of people that visit wineries are making over $100,000 a year. And if we average it out, the age range is in that, I'll call it baby, baby boomer range of 47 years old. These people are educated and the majority of them at 64% are female. When people visit a winery, if the winery's in, I'll call it a, a neck of the woods that's kind of by itself, people are spending $147 on average per visit. If there's many wineries, and I, I think of California because that's what comes to mind, um, people are spending about $48 per visit. So it's a pretty substantial amount of money that people are spending on wine. People who drink wine uh, are more likely to read what I'll call specialty magazines, things like Wine Spectator, uh, Gourmet Food magazines, that kind of thing. Um, more likely to stay at upscale resorts and use high-end I'll call it stainless steel appliances, which I think directly converts into high efficiency uh, air conditioning and furnace equipment. Wine consumption in the United States is up, and it's up substantially. Um, the United States is buying more wine than any other country which used to be dominated by France. Americans are drinking more Italian wine than Italians. But that was interesting. And we're going through somewhere in the neighborhood of over 300 million cases of wine a year. Now, they break that down by what they call core drinkers which are people who are, are drinking wine daily or at least weekly. And that's about 21% are considered core wine drinkers. And they make up about 47 million people. 34 million are what I'll call occasional or what they call marginal drinkers who drink once in a while. But that totals 81 million people in the United States who are drinking wine on a regular basis. Give them this slide just a minute to upload. So of the wine consumption, the, the people um, who, I'm going to say, account for most of the wine sales over $20, they're what are considered high-end drinkers. It's 23% of the market, which equals 9 million people. And they are responsible for the majority of wine sales over $20. So when we look at it, you know, it, I'll say that this market is really nah, – I don't want to say that. I'm sorry, can, can you hear me? I cut off for a second. 
So as we look at some other wine markets, wine is sometimes more than just a hobby for people. It's really a business. You know, people buy, sell, and trade wine. It's almost like a stock or an investment. You know, we've seen sellers that, you know, are actually barcoded. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of wine in in certain sellers. One other market that, you know, we don't think of very often is fur rooms. And furs also have to be, you know, cooled down but also kept humidified. So wine cellar units work really well for the few wine rooms that are, or I'm sorry, for the fur, <laughs> few fur rooms that are out there. The other opportunity is a commercial. We're seeing more, you know, restaurants, bars, and wineries that need some type of a cellar. So when we start looking at why do uh, wine bottles have to be kept at different temperatures, it really you know gets down to where we don't want that cork to dry out. If it does dry out, the wine goes bad prematurely. So what that means is you know 70, 70 degrees is bad for wines. What we really want it to be is about 55 degrees. It's really what I'll call the sweet spot for it. We also want to keep the relative humidity somewhere in that, I, I like to call it 50 to 55 percent range, um, because we keep that cork wet and we don't allow um, bad stuff to grow. Because you start getting you know, much more than 60 percent and you can get mold. The other thing I want to point out here is that when we're talking about this, we're really talking about red wines in particular. Uh, white wines don't have the same um, limitations or expectations of temperature and humidity as red wines would. We want to keep them a little bit colder, but they don't have to be um, you know, refrigerated, I guess would be the, the best word for that. When we start looking at a wine cellar, I like to view the room as a box. And as long as we keep that box you know, well insulated, you should be fine. Uh, but the one thing I wanted to caution you of is you know, we've run into situations where these wine cellars are in a basement. And if that basement has radiant heat, we, um, we can have issues because the two systems start fighting each other. So just be aware if you're putting these systems into a space that has radiant heat already in it. It gets pretty interesting. When we look at sizing, sizing is all based on cubic feet. So we're not dealing with square feet at all. So in a what I'll call a typical situation, um, a 10 by 10 room with 10 foot ceilings is a thousand cubic feet space. And for that application, we use the BCS 1000, which can do a thousand cubic feet uh, wine cellar. If you run into applications that are bigger than, say, 3,000 square feet, we can uh, do custom size units, uh, but they do take a little while, somewhere between four to eight weeks to, to get a custom unit. These are coming out of uh, Ohio. As we get into the components of the system, and this is really where I'd like to spend the most time because the, they are a little bit different than the, the units we deal with on a daily basis. When we look at a typical setup of a wine cellar system, there's really three basic components to a system. You've got the condenser, which can be either outside or inside. You've got an evaporator, and then you've got a control that runs the whole thing. The evaporator is mounted indoors, and this guy comes in two flavors. 
So the first one is a ceiling suspended model. And the next one is a ducted model. So one where it hangs in the space, the other one where it's kind of above maybe a drop ceiling and then ducted in. Give this just a second to upload. The evaporator itself is a stainless steel, call it a box. And I'm not, I don't even know how to pronounce this blower, but it's basically those um, long, thin blowers, and there's two of them, and it makes the unit quiet. We want to mount this thing in the, the middle of the room or in the middle as you can. Really what we're looking for is, I'm going to call it 24 inches of space behind this evaporator to give it a little bit of breathing room. The units themselves are uh, small, we call it attractive, and all we have available is the split style systems. We don't have anything that's um, packaged right now. If we move to the condensing unit, I just wanted to show you a picture of the, the unit itself, kind of opened up so you can see some of the components. So this condensing unit has a Danfoss compressor. It is a scroll style, and it uses 134A. Uh, the condensing unit can be mounted indoors, and if you put it outdoors, you need a low ambient control and then also a unit enclosure. Standard components on the condenser are, you know, filter dryer, sight glass, low pressure switch, uh, fan cycling control, and it comes with a crankcase heater. Um, I point this out because a lot of people view these systems as duct-free splits, and this system has a whole lot of components that are not in a typical duct-free split. Not only are they not in it, they're not recommended for duct-free splits. So this is a very different type of a unit. This is showing you the, um, I call it line drawing of the condensing unit with some of the components on there. And I always like to, to bring up, if you run into an application that uses a water-cooled condenser, you know, we have it available. So this unit's coming with a regulator valve. The system is controlled by the BCS digital microprocessor. Um, I, I'm viewing this as the user interface with the system. So they're using this control to control temperature and humidity. Uh, it's high end and easy to use, you know, and, and we feel that it gives the homeowner um, confidence because it is a standalone control that's pretty basic up down. In the control, there are some options that are available, um, and this system can actually monitor and alert via email um, alert conditions. So if it, you know, temperature raises or the humidity gets uh, too low, it can send out an email and let the homeowner know what's going on with the system. So they can get somebody over there to take a look at it. As we get into the install, uh, this is a pretty good list of the items that are needed. I wouldn't call it complete. Uh, we're using dual insulated line sets here. 
um, quarter inch copper line, you need a quarter inch condensate line, which is usually like a, a vinyl uh, tube, so it's pretty small. Uh, you're going to need your circuit, and that ranges from you know 15 amps to 30 amps, depending on which system you're using. Um, 18.6, I'm calling it shielded. They don't really specify shielded, but um, there's been a few issues where we're getting uh, feedback from other components, so I threw it in there. It doesn't have to be 18.6 shielded, but I threw it in there just to be safe. 12.2, um, with a ground for your power. Uh, if this thing's going outside, you're going to want a condenser pad. Uh, maybe it's brackets if you're hanging it, or uh, maybe hanging it some other way. I need a double gang box for the control, and then don't forget the vibration pads. I got a question here, so I'm stopping for just a second to make sure I can read this. Yeah, I got a question that asked if the humidifier spray is built into the unit, and it is. It has a uh, solenoid on it. We are just providing the water to the indoor unit. So as we start with the install, um, you're going to want the condenser to be level. That's pretty standard. Uh, I like to use four anti-vibration pads, and then we're going to start by brazing in the suction in liquid lines. This is about the best picture I could find of this unit being um, brazed in. So it's really just a guy's hand holding the flame. So I talked about the dual insulated line sets. Uh, the line sets we have are actually flared, uh, mainly for duct-free splits. So you'd have to cut the line and then braze it into the unit. Um, the power from the disconnect to the condenser is 12.2 with a ground. And then we're going to look at the low pressure control. Um, and those settings are going to be 25 PSI with a 15 PSI differential. And here's a picture of the low pressure control. Leave that up just for a sec. Make sure it downloads. All right, as we move into the evaporator, again, these are ceiling mounted, one somewhere in the, the middle of the room. Oh, and then I, I already talked about the breathing space in the back of the unit of about 24 inches. Here's a line drawing of the evaporator. And two things I want you to look at here. The first thing is that three inch hole, kind of right in the middle of the unit. That's where you're going to pull the, um, the line set and any wires that you would need. The other thing is you've got a ton of options for the mounting holes. So you should be able to grab something significant with all the different options you have. I think they're um, calling for molly bolts to, to hang these. All right, as we talk about the evaporator, um, <laughs> here I switched to 14 2 instead of 12 2. And the, the reason for that is some of the units you can get away with a 14 gauge wire, others you need a 12 gauge. So I apologize for not keeping it consistent, um, but depending on the unit, it would be 14 gauge or 12 gauge. And then you would also have your 18 6 gauge wire for your control wiring. Here's a diagram of the uh, I'm sorry, the um, power to the unit, 14.2 with a ground, in some cases 12.2. We already talked about the 3x3 three three hole. Here's an actual um, install picture of the 3-inch hole. You can see the line set coming through and then also the wires coming through that hole as well. Humidification. Uh, we're using quarter inch copper. I think that's pretty standard for humidification. Um, and then running that wire, or I'm sorry, that copper to a uh, compression fitting. 
and that's a picture of the humidification solenoid. I tried grabbing a picture of it uh, actually spraying, but you, you can't see the mist. So here's a, a line drawing I think shows the, the idea of the compression fitting for the water solenoid a little bit better than the actual picture. And this unit also comes equipped with a small condensate pump. So it's got a small condensate pump. It's uh, enclosed in stainless steel. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that this is a really small condensate pump. So it's designed to get water you know, out of the unit, maybe across a room. But if you've got to go more than, I'll call it 15 feet, you, you really want to look at doing some sort of a, a secondary pump, especially if you're not you know, on a downhill slope. So it has a uh, TXV in the evaporator and we're going to want to remove that when we go to braze. This is showing a picture that the, the TXV is actually pretty easy to remove. It's just a, it's almost like a thumb screw. So you unscrew that, the clamp loosens and you can pull that guy out. And this is just showing you the, the loose clamp with the TXV coming down. So you're able to braze in the line sets to the evaporator. All right, so now I'm kind of switching gears on you. I'm going back to the condenser. The condenser has a fan cycling switch. And this switch will um, turn off the fan if we hit low ambient conditions. Unit has uh, service valves. And what I want you to remember is that we're dealing with 134A. And the other thing is, um, this unit does not need gauge adapters. So a lot of the, the duct-free splits we work with need gauge adapters. This unit does not. This is showing that the unit comes with a filter dryer. Giving it just a second. The unit also comes with a sight glass, small little sight glass. All right, so once the installation is complete, we want to evacuate and pressure check the system. We're looking to take this guy down to about 500 microns. When we charge the system, uh, again, I think for the third or fourth time, we're dealing with 134A. Uh, they want the sight glass to be clear, and the TXV should be running at about you know 12 to 14 degrees of superheat. And then at that point, we'd you know weigh in a little bit of refrigerant if we needed it. All right, so going back to the evaporator, uh, this unit comes standard with two float switches. Um, the lower one is going to shut off the water. The second one is going to shut off the unit. And it's going to assume that you know there's a pump failure or something going on with the unit, so it will shut off the whole entire thing. Here's the line drawing of the float switches. This one's kind of upside down if you can think of it that way. Now we're moving into the wiring. Um, so we're going to wire the humidity sensor. The humidity sensor is two wires. Um, and here we're dealing with that 18.6. So you're going to use your red wire to go to number one, white wire to go to number two. And this sensor is polarity sensitive. So you want to be careful of that. And then here's a picture of the humidity sensor 
with red going to number one and white going to number two. Here's a drawing of the, oh, that is the, that's the humidity sensor. But what we do typically is put the temperature sensor right above the humidity sensor. Oh, um, I'm getting a question on which evaporator comes with a float switch. So we're talking today about the, the Bacchus line of wine cellar systems, and all the Bacchus systems come with uh, humidity uh, capabilities in them, and they also come with the primary and secondary float switches to prevent uh, any kind of drain issues. All right, so back to this picture. The, the lower part is the humidity sensor, and right above it is where we mount the temperature sensor. So here I'm showing you the, um, the control, the user interface. Blue and yellow wires, what, are, what I'm really trying to get to is this brown and blue wire that's coming into the control that is from your temperature sensor. I can give this just a second to finish uploading. Right, trying to read the questions. Um, so here's the temperature sensor, it's the brown and blue. These are not polarity sensitive. I've got a, a comment here. Uh, it says because they have a wet sump, they actually hold several ounces of water. And then here is the wiring diagram for the control. You got two wires going to the temperature sensor, that's your brown and blue. Two wires going to the humidity sensor, which is your white and red, and those are polarity sensitive. And then you've got your um, called circuit board or user interface control. Here's a picture of the control uh, fully installed, and it has like a little um, cover for it so that you're not hitting buttons uh, accidentally. And you see it's LED readout, and it is a push button type of control. When you're done with the, uh, the wiring and the brazing in of the line sets and the water, you put the cover back on, and as you can see, the cover is stainless steel. And then as we go to the outdoor unit, because this is an outdoor ins installation, um, we're putting the enclosure on, and I like to call it a, a dog cage to protect this unit. I'm going to run through just a, a few pictures of actual installed units.
that's it. I wanted to say thank you, and I will leave this open for uh, just a few minutes if there's any questions. Again, a question on the um, service and maintenance of these units and if there's a pad to be changed. And the answer is no. There's no um, pad in these units, but there is a water filter. So you're kind of changing an inline water filter for these. And you're also going to want to um, take a look at the nozzle head, which would have to um, be cleaned or possibly even replaced as the line lime and calcium tends to build up on that nozzle. I get a question on larger units and if we're if we're supposed to use two of these things, um, the answer is we can, but I guess the better answer is we can custom make larger units if you need them. So if you've got a you know six thousand cubic feet, you can use two threes or you can get one six. It really depends on um, how you want to do it and if the mounting and everything makes more sense with one or with two. But we can get these pretty big if we need them. Uh, I'm trying to understand this question. Um, the water filter and nozzle head control the amount of humidity added. Uh, the answer is kind of no. We're not modulating the humidity output. Basically what happens is that control says, hey, we need humidity, and it adds it until such time it says we don't need it anymore. So it's not really sophisticated in a sense. We're not, you know, adjusting the output of humidity. It's just an on or off depending on the, the needs of the space. Well, I think that'll wrap it up. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know, and I thank you so much for your time.